Our guest, D.W. Tripp, the biker on Board Game Geek. We caught up with D.W. in East Tennessee. That's right, where Greg Slosser lives. Before we talk to him, he's agreed to do a stunt for us. He's going to attempt to jump over Greg Slosser's entire game collection, 500 games laid end-to-end, D.W. Tripp, over the ramp and over Greg Slosser's game collection for us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, D.W. Tripp is warming up over there with his bike. Greg can't speak to us. He's white as a ghost, scared to death that some of his games may get damaged. Let's watch the stunt. Here comes D.W. He's warming up for the stunt. Here he comes, approaching the ramp. He looks confident. Greg has got, he's got his hands over his eyes. There he goes. Here he comes, approaching the ramp, D.W. Oh my goodness. There he goes, he's up. Whoa! Ladies and gentlemen, DW Trip has oh oh ooh! Oh, he didn't make it. He hit one game, crushed the last game in line. Greg is running over. Oh my god, Kalis got smashed by DW Trip's bike. But he made it. Oh, all, all made it, missed it by one game, but there's no great loss. Kalis was smashed, but there's no great loss. DW Trip, let's talk with him. Now, we were talking earlier today about uh, your game store. You were you were in business for 23 years, right? 23 years, man. Unbelievable. And when did you close the store? Uh, about a year ago. And was there a reason you closed it? or, or You want to go into what? that? or? Yeah. <laughs> there, there was a multitude of reasons, Steve. About ascending cost and descending margins. Right. That's probably a big one. Were you? I guess. I guess, like a lot of uh, people in in the gaming shops, uh, you were affected by uh, the internet sales, right? Yeah, you know, but I don't know. I mean, I've made kind of a big deal out of that on Board Game Geek, but you know, to tell you the truth, though, they don't impact a. a you know, full spectrum game store that much. Right. Um, main thing is, if you really think about it, I don't know how the hell old you are, but, you know, would you like to be 60 years old or something selling freaking Yu Gi Oh cards to 11 year old gangsters? <laughs> <laughs> I can see where that would get old, yeah. Dude, I got to tell you, that was, that was one of my motivations for sure. Yeah. You know, I just, I mean, 23 years of, now here in Houston we do have a we do have a shop and that does seem to be the big sellers the Yu Gi Oh cards the collectible cards yeah um, yeah I mean it, you know it just gets old um, you know like anything I mean there's there's not a whole hell of a lot that uh, really I mean in the game industry that that uh, I would want to do for twenty three years other than retail I now did get you, it so I'm done. Right. Did you have, like, uh, a game group that would normally come in your shop, or were you a member of a game group, or what? No, I was the game guru. I ah. was not a member. The group organized and, you know, formed around me. <laughs> 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 well, of course we had groups. Yeah, you know, it was a regulation game store. It was world famous. Right. Now, um, what do... Let's talk about sales in, in your store. Uh, you, you mentioned the Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Now, when you got into the board games, what did you see selling there? Well, I carried board games from the get-go. I mean, I opened the store in 83. Right. 82, actually, November of 82. Right. And I opened it with board games and role-playing games and miniatures and dice. That's what I opened it with. So, you know, I had uh, 23 years' experience of selling board games and um, you know they always sold well for me they never really well, board games were never more than probably the max 25 percent of yeah. my total sales right you know it's hard to beat uh you know D D was so popular in the 80s and then the vampire came along and everyone started wearing skirts you know and putting makeup on and so that got real popular <laughs> now did you see a the big... guys that were wearing the skirts right did you see a big uh, Euro craze at your shop? Well, you know, I, no, not really. Uh, the seller was a Catan. Um, you know, I used to bullshit with the uh, Mayfair guys. I'd go to Gamma every year and would play in the big poker 
thing that they have down there, and we would always talk about sellers. And my little store, Chris, you know, I probably sold 300 copies a year. You know, it was a it was a two to 300, 350 unit a year game system for me. That was a big one. Now, do you agree with uh, Michael that that uh, typically you didn't see any anybody going past settlers? No, there, there was two kinds of people that that would buy that game. There was the the regular game geek, like the guy that played D and D or whatever. He was a magic player, and he would see us playing it because we did demos and we had game nights in the store. We did the whole thing, right? And we would get that guy to play. He would buy it, and settlers is like a virus. It's what it's like. I mean, you know, yeah. sit down. And I'm, I agree with Michael as far as the uh, the raw power of the game to convert people right. to, to gaming outside of the scope of Monopoly. But the, the, the secondary sales were the relatives. And they were the people that someone came from Boston, you know, to visit the relatives over Christmas, brought a game of settlers. And that one night of... of Playing settlers would generate two or three or four sales in my store of people that you never saw again. Right. Because they got the virus. It's like a flu bug. You know, they were afflicted. They had to have that game. They picked up the phone. They started calling. Bingo. What do you What do you think it is about that game? Why did that you call it a virus? What do you think it is that is so addicting about it? Uh, that game has everything as far as, as what most people, to me anyway, what most people who are going to approach board games beyond the scope of, of a Monopoly or a Yahtzee type of game. It's got everything. It's got the dice. It's got the, the different terrain every time you turn it up. It's got the little buildings and the roads. It's got the interaction and the trading. It's got the screw your buddy. It's, right. You know, it's a brilliant design. I, I'm, I'm with uh, uh, the board game geek contingent on that one. I think it's uh, it's definitely one of the top 50 games that's ever been made. Now, what do you, what do you think about the expansion, Cities and Nights? Do you think, are you, they add to it, or are you... Are you a big I think it adds quite a bit to it. Uh, I'm a real fan of, of just the basic settlers with the five and six player expansion. Right. But yes, I, I'm, I'm a, uh, a believer that unless you push people to buy outside of the scope of what they're comfortable playing, they won't go any further. Now let's talk about, you mentioned poker, and I see that on your profile, that's your number one game. That's my uh, only 10. Your only 10. Yeah, and I also know that you are the only biker I've ever seen on Board Game Geek. I mean, do you know of any others? Um, I think the easy, the physicist up in Ohio or um, Illinois or something, Michael Panese, I think he's got a Harley. Uh, okay. No, bike, you know, motorcycles are not a, uh, I don't know what it is about game geekiness and motorcycle geekiness that don't seem to go together. Oh, wait a minute, Pro Noblem, the, the socialist. From right, the right. Campus, yeah. Got a Honda Goldwing, you know, which is like. Yeah. That's my point. I, you, I, I don't see the you. You mentioned the board game geekiness and the bikes; they don't seem to go together. That's what I want to ask you. What What are the top games for bikers? <laughs> if you had to pick some games for bikers, what would they play outside of poker? Well, they would play poker. There's no doubt about that. There's probably uh, I don't know. You ever played Mumbly Peg? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. What, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, well, mumbly peg with chainsaws, maybe. <laughs> uh, what would I do with a bunch of bikers? I'd, I'd bring liars dice. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I can see that going good with those guys. Yeah, um, probably. How about Monsters Minus America? That'd be a good biker game, right? Yeah, I mean, it's community like board gaming. I mean, you can, I can, I could fly down to Houston and email you and. I'll, half a dozen other people in the area and play games at someone's house I'd never met. Right. And, uh, you know, I think bikes are pretty much the same way, you know, to me anyway. I, I just don't think that they're, uh, you know, I think that as far as board game geek itself goes and the, the whole kind of Euro uh, influence, you know, I, I just don't think that that's a uh, lifestyle that embraces 
some of the more cruder things that go on in this world that happen to be fun. <laughs> right. It's, now, what um, you mentioned on your profile, you really like war games, but you have trouble pe- finding people to play. No. What are your top war games that you yeah. like? You know, right now the war game that uh, that I probably think is the best designed is probably Europe and Golf, and I played it once. That's the Combat Commander. No, well, Combat Commander I have, and I played it solo, so I can't. You know, I can't say it, it's a top war game. Here's my problem with war games, is, and I think this this goes back to something that Barnes, you know, said that that made perfect sense to me is. With, uh, or, or at least he alluded to it. You know, if you're introduced with games that have a page and a half of rules, and that's what you play, that's what you play, that's what you play. Right. To to make that lead to something, you know, that has more depth to it, or at least is more complicated, or, or to where you have to ingest a lot more material. Right. It's very hard for some people to do. But if you get started with, with war games, and you come into the hobby... From the perspective of you've got you know twelve hundred little chips, you know, and you've got all these military symbols, and you've got exactly these, yeah, yeah. Rules. it's different. It is different, yeah. Well, to, to get uh, to get these guys that I game with to play something, I mean, I'll tell you what they will play. They'll play attack with the expansion. What do you think of that game? I think that game's great. Of course, you know, every time we play it, um, we find out we've played it wrong the time before. And you're you do need the expansion on that, right? To yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah. I mean, you could throw the attack away, and it, you know it's a useless game. But when you put the expansion in there, it becomes. I mean, to me, it's a true Ameritrash game. Yeah, it, it's just got pretty much everything you could want. And um, that's what you talk about attack. That's a game that really took a hit on that side too. Yeah, I did, but you know, so what. <laughs> right. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's in my top uh, my top games right now to play. Mainly because I still haven't played the game correctly, and I just you know it's kind of like you get a new experience when you when you don't digest rules well, which I don't anymore. Right. Uh, every time you play a game, it's like playing a new game because you find something that you did wrong. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, that that tells a lot about the strength of a good game design. If you can play it wrong seventeen times and still enjoy it, it's pretty good design. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Power Grid would be my number one on that one. Power Grid. Yeah, I played that game wrong. Choose first thirty or forty times I played it. I don't read rules well anymore, Steve. But just you know, I I suffered some sort of a an SPI Avalon Hill neural meltdown in the eighties and. Right. Now, you were talking, exactly, you were talking about somebody that comes into the hobby from, like, I came in from the Avalon Hill side. And those, I mean, you know, being 12, 13 years old, reading those rules, and then comparing that to some of the easy rules today, it's, uh, I see what you're talking about there. I mean, it's these Euro games are nothing compared to that. I mean, you know, there's... You know, I'm not saying that, you know, just because a game has a page and a half of rules that it, it's for, you know, people of low IQ. Right. Um, although, you know, if you have a low IQ, you know, it, it, there's a lot more games to play now since the Euro games have come along that you can understand easier. But, uh, you know, it, it's just that, that game, maybe the sellers as a, as a, a starting point. Well, gaming has really changed in the last 15 or 20 years. And these designs that everyone is calling elegant, which I don't like that word. I prefer the word simple. Uh, you know, they, they've uh, expanded the the population base of gamers. But as Michael says, and I agree, and I think you agree, uh, and I've discussed it with other people, they don't tend to always move on and embrace the, the the broader spectrum of games that the hobby has to offer yeah. from the Euro game standpoint. And that's just my subjective opinion. Right. This, uh, you know, that's what I see. Now, you mentioned today, I was reading some of your comments just today, you said you, you actually uh, do like 
to read uh, Tom Vassell's reviews. I do like Tom Vassell's reviews. Yes, I do. Uh, can you do you find them uh, very informative, or what? What well, do you like about it? You know, here's what Tom does. That, and I've read a lot of reviews. Um, you know, Tom likes most games. And so when he writes a review, or I even think when he sits down to play a game, whether he got it for free or not, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have some attitude like he's some sort of a self-anointed uh, judge with a superior intellect and he's going to approach this game and he's going <laughs> to yeah. dig up all the flaws that the yeah. poor, sad, pathetic idiot that, that designed the game committed. He approaches the whole thing from the perspective of, hey, here's a game, here's how you play it, here's what it looks like, and this is why we had fun playing it. And he will say things that he believes are, well, if the word is flawed is correct. But, you know, I just think he has a positive attitude. Right. So I like reading his, I like reading his reviews. I don't like a lot of the games he likes, but I think he's a great reviewer, and that's just, you know, Right. Uh, he takes a lot of heat on board game peak for being too. Uh, yeah, off. too positive on everything is, uh, I think, what what I see a lot. Yeah, and I tend to agree with. But I can see your point of view on that as well. Uh, wh- you mentioned what other what other games you play in uh, these days? So I mentioned Attack, of course. You know and that uh, I need to play that again because I reread the rules and found a couple of other things we were doing wrong. Right. How many people you normally play that with? We just did it with five about a week ago. Yeah. Any other bikers in the group? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no bikers. You know. Okay. Um, and just, really, uh, but there's a couple of really large guys, though. Uh, Jumbo, my normal playing partner, would make a good biker. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I like, right now, I do like Battle War. I think that's really a good game. I, I own all of the Commands and Colors. Games. Okay. I think they're excellent. Um, Roro Tycoon, definitely. I play that as often as I can get someone to play it. Um, let me think. Wizard, you know the card game Wizard? I oh, like yeah. It. Love that. Love it. Oh, I, I like a couple of the Risk variants quite a bit. I like the 2210 and the Lord of the Rings Risk. Um, I think right. those are good games. What else have I been playing? Oh, Formula Day. I always like that game. Yes. I agree with you on that too. Uh, I have some of the extra tracks on that. We we have tried to get a league going. You know, a, a normal actually run a whole season on that. Oh, we did that for like three years at my store. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we had money. The whole thing going. Yeah, that's, they said that's know, a way to really have fun stuff, with it. You know, stuff with cash. Everyone had to pay like two or three bucks to raise. And it was great, man. Now I I saw that where they're reprinting that. Are they coming out with are they, are they reprinting the tracks as well? Do you know on that? No, they're not. No, as a matter of fact, if uh, anyone listening to this podcast, if they have that last track set that uh, was printed, I forget which ones it was. Um, one of them like in Saudi Arabia or somewhere. Uh, contact me and I'll trade you something for it because you know I never got that one. So you have them all but that one? Got everything but that one, and uh, that's it. I understand that this is kind of a Mercy reprint, you know, kind oh, of really? like Hoffman thing. What's your favorite track on that game? You know, uh, probably, just for sheer fun, the Anniversary track. I've got that one. That is a kick in the butt. But there's another one, what we used to do in our league, is we would run like a full season of, say, 10 races. And then we would have, you can take, I think, uh, I forget exactly which track it is, um, Andervoort or Nibbling Ring or one of those. You can take it and put two tracks together. Yeah, the big jumbo one. Yeah, I have that as well. Right. And that was always our, what we did at the end of our league was we had a six-hour race. You did three laps on that monster? Yeah, we put the monster together and then we would get 10 or 12 guys down at the store at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, we'd get pizza. I'd buy the pizza for everyone. We'd all put five bucks in the in the hat, and we'd all start with two cars, and we would race for six hours. Now, when you Whoever play that, yeah. the most laps in six hours, one. Wow. Here take all. 
Now, when you play that, what uh, do you use any of the optional rules on that? Yeah, we use them all. So that's some that we made up. All right. What are some of the ones you made up? Well, uh, you know the uh, well. If if you recall, in the very uh, this isn't actually one we made up, but in the very first incarnation of that game, there was a particular rule that at any point during the game, you could expend one engine point to go one. Yeah, I think they call that, that the redlining. Yeah, whatever they call well, you it. Redline you redline the engine, yeah. Redlining. But then they took that rule out. From what I, I didn't see that rule in the in the latest version of the game that I have. So we put that back in. So you can do it as much as you want until your engine blows up. Oh. And I liked it. It was a good rule. You know, you see a lot of people blowing their engines up. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite games. Um, yeah, hey, you know another game that uh, I don't think gets a lot of love on the. Uh, on well, board game geek anyway, uh, is backgammon. I play that as often. Oh, I love backgammon. Yeah, it's just uh, I mean, to me, again, you've got it's just the dice. I think the dice is what I like about backgammon. Rather than the doubling cube, and you're playing for money. You got to play with the doubling cube, absolutely. Uh, for money, that that game is ruthless too. It is. It's, it's a good one. I used to play that with my brother a lot for money, and um, you know, he won't talk to me uh, these last twenty five years, but. <laughs> Was it because of backgammon? Yeah, pretty much. You know. <laughs> well, you know, man, you don't, you just don't want to play for paychecks, you know, with the devil and cube. Yeah, that's a good. Let's talk about that. Uh, have you found any of these uh, popular games on Board Game Geek that have been really good for gambling? That's oh, just really? Uh, you know, the only ones that I really like to play for money are poker and backgammon, and then what we used to do with the league. And, you know, we discussed it with a couple of the games, like um, I just got that reissue of, uh, what the hell's that horse racing game that just came back out last year? Oh, Royal Turf or Winter, yeah, yeah. Winter Circle, yeah. I think? Yeah, it's Winter Circle now. We discussed actually gambling with that one, but, you know, it just we, I don't know, second or third beer into the game, you know, you just, they're demotivated for money. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why we don't. We don't gamble with any of the games here. We just don't. I notice you don't like. You don't like uh, Texas Hold'em. Is that right? No, I think Texas Hold'em is uh, just bad. Here, I think it's just. It's made poker low class to me. Really? Yeah, to me, I, I don't like it. It's just. Yeah. I understand it, and I understand why some people do like it. That. Generally speaking, people that really, really like Texas Hold'em are people that don't want to make the effort to really understand poker. Right. They love it, you know, and it's kind of like the difference between driving an automatic and a shift. You know, it's a lot easier just to put it in drive and go. Did you actually try it for a while and got disenchanted with it, or you never did <laughs> like it? From the I did. Uh, it, it first started gaining popularity around these parts, and when I'd go to Vegas, probably about 15 years ago, and I played it a little bit. Uh, and then I had a regular poker group here for 15 years that was not even involved with my game store. It was a bunch of, uh, let's just say, other people. Right. And, you know, some of them would just insist on playing it, so I did, and I don't like it. I mean, I'd rather play baseball or something like that. Than, yeah. You, you play baseball with the threes and the nines. Yeah, yeah. Thing, yeah. You know, or AC Doocy or something like that. I just don't like it. So, what's your what's your thoughts on the uh, on this uh, this funny little war, the Ameritrash war going on Board Game Geek? You I actually said you actually said today that you were responsible for one portion of it. Well, no, well, I was just coining the word Euro Snoop, but are you, so you coined that phrase? I did indeed, <laughs> and yeah, because it's what it felt like to me. A couple of years ago, when I, you know, first started being a little more vocal about things, uh, you know, it just sort of felt like that, that if it wasn't designed by, you know, the, I guess the round table of German mathematicians, right? It, it really didn't get a lot of love, and and I played a lot of those games, and I found them, uh, you know, to tell you the truth, boring. A lot of them, and you know, I know that. That's one of the big what arguments on Board Game Geek is that, that in a, a guy who likes the mirror trash or games with chance or randomity in them just doesn't understand. But, you know, 
I don't view it that way, you know. It, I, I just think that it, maybe if you're, I don't know, anal retentive, uh, <laughs> OCD afflicted, tea drinking, metrosexual, arrogant, wussy boy, you might be. <laughs> <laughs> don't you hate that metrosexual stuff? Oh, I just. <laughs> Who came up with that? In crawl. Who came up with that? I don't know, man, but you see it in the freaking commercials, too, like, you know, the Ford commercials and stuff. They're all appealing to those guys whose hair is kind of fluffed and, you know, like they look like they just got out of bed. <laughs> right, right. That's that whole metrosexual look, you know. Right. I think that's a good analogy. I never I never thought about that, that the metrosexual is kind of the Euro. They kind yeah, of fit together. Well, except that, you know. I mean, there's no confrontation there. There's no... Um, well, there is if you play the craftsman at the wrong time, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I like your I like your variant of the uh, the uh, Puerto Rico with the uh, with the I'd boats. I'd love to see it. With I can boats? improve golf too. If, if <laughs> I would play golf if they would, uh, you know, add a few things like uh, landmines and there you go. You know, grenade launchers to key off with, stuff like that. So I read in your profile, too, you, are you actually designing some games? I have a few titles, yeah. 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 They, they suck. Oh, you got some out there already? I don't know. Well, I will tell you this. I did write and sold, um, I think, around 2,500, maybe 3,000 copies of a role-playing game in the 80s. That, that was my claim to fame as far as game design. Have we heard of it? I mean, you want to give well, the name it, of it? It's that? a cult classic. Which one? It's a cult classic. It's called Excursion in the Bazaar. And uh, I didn't, you know, the thing about it is I wanted to write a game. We had uh, myself and my partner at the time had a miniature company. It was uh, doing very well and did very well in the 80s. And I wanted to have a product to go to Gen Con and, and Origins and right. the places that, that wasn't just miniatures. So I sat down one weekend and wrote a game. And what we did is we took the game and designed a bunch of bizarre miniatures to it. Right. And then I printed up 1,500 copies of the game and we took it to Gen Con and it sold very well. Oh, that's so cool. I printed up another 1,000 copies and sold them to distributors and... And then I abandoned it because I I actually never played the game because right. I don't like role playing games. Can you still find that game? Uh... Probably not. It, it, you know, there was only twenty five hundred of them, and it was a like a you know it was like a pamphlet size game, right? Maybe sixty or seventy pages at most. It was called Excursion in the Bazaar, and it was you know black and white. Yeah. With a uh, how would I describe the art that was on the cover? Mm, shitty? That would be a good description. <laughs> You're too hard on yourself. I like the title. Well, the title was good. The miniatures sold pretty well. Yeah. Uh, you can still find the miniatures from time to time on eBay. Um, mm -hmm. Game designs that I'm doing right now, by the way, are um, that probably are never going to see the light of day. And they really are based around the, the classic kind of Ameritrash style gaming that's been being discussed on Board Game Geek over the last six or seven, eight months. You know, okay. conflict, combat, and if I ever did get them produced, I'd want to have plastic pieces with them. And well, that's good. Let's hope we get those out there because we certainly can use more games like that. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'd, I'd like to have... Uh, I, I think I would shoot low... As far as my expectations, I'd like to maybe sell as many copies as Alan Moon did of Ticket to Ride, just to start off with. That's about a half a million, though, isn't it? Yeah, you know, and you figure if you're getting, I don't know, half a buck to a buck per game, yeah. after it's all said and done, you could do okay. Yeah. I'll tell you what, you ought to go ahead and uh, submit that to Days of Wonder, and let's get it out there. Yeah, I'm sure that they'd love it. <laughs> all right, I don't want to take up your whole night, DW. Thanks for talking with us. Hey, and uh, you know what? I'm looking, really looking forward to the, the Thornquist interview and the Schlossinator. I'm trying to get them on the show. They, Holy, I want to hear them all. Okay. We're going to try to get them on for you. And, uh, you know, we're going to be courteous to them. We just want to hear their side of the story. We want to hear, hear their views. Cool. 
Hey, glad I could fill in, man, when you had the when you had the spot. I really appreciate it. Have a good evening. See you, Steve. Thanks.